Hello. Today, we are going to talk about uh, just the introduction. We're just giving an introduction to probability distributions. Okay. And actually, let me say this. We are, in this course, not going to cover, we're not going to just cover 4.3. Okay, so we're just going to cover 4.1 and 4.2. <clears throat> All right. So this section, we're going to introduce this concept of probability distributions. And we've got four main goals. So the first one is to distinguish between discrete and continuous. So the keywords here, discrete and continuous random variables. Oh, yeah, by the way random variable is um, frequently abbreviated as RV. So for instance, if you're Googling or looking online or if you're reading an article, um, instead of writing out the entire word random variable, frequently you'll just see RV. Okay, so that's the first is distinguishing between discrete and continuous random variables. Then the second one is constructing a probability distribution and its graph. Its graph is essentially a histogram. So we're going to learn how to construct a probability distribution. Okay. And uh, then we're going to learn how to find the mean variance and standard deviation of a probability distribution. It's going to be very similar to um, the mean variance and standard deviation of grouped data. And the key for us is going to be to use technology. So if the... Um, so the book is going to show you how to use these tables and charts and all of that. But again, really the way to go is to use technology. Thank you. And so I will post, there should be some videos actually up now. Both the YouTube video to show, YouTube videos showing how to find the mean variance and standard deviation with your TI-84 and a PDF. Okay, so between both of those, uh, whatever is your preference, um, you know, PDF or watching a video, that information will be up there. So, in fact, when you're going through the this video right here, this lecture, pause when we get to those examples, go look and see how to use technology, and then come back to the lecture. That way you can follow better, because I'm going to be assuming that you're using technology while we do, while we do our example problems. And the last, the last uh, objective, learning objective, is finding uh, the expected value. Expected value is a pretty important concept because it's very useful. So when you're, you know, when you buy a lottery ticket, how much money do you expect to win, right? If you're investing in a product, how much money do you expect to receive back, right? How much money do you expect to, what return do you expect on your investment? So you know, these are really expectation really really key this is why people study uh, statistics right and why statistics is important it's because it allows you to anticipate or puts a science to kind of anticipating what return you're going to get on whatever investment um, so of course I always have a question on my exam that involves expectation because that's how important it is okay so let's go ahead and get started. So first I want to introduce this concept of random variables, as we said. Now random variable, it might seem like it's pretty abstract, but it's not. We know what variables are, right? So you can have a variable, how tall is a person, right? That's a variable. Because it depends on the person, Right? So in order to know how tall someone is, you'd have to measure them. Could be that they're six foot tall, could be that they're five foot tall, could be that they're two foot tall. Right? So that's a variable, meaning that the answer depends on the person. A random variable is kind of taking this to the next level. So random variable is it's kind of like a function, but it's more than a function. It's a, it's a random variable, and it represents a numerical value that's associated with each outcome of a probability distribution. 
So let's just kind of get into this a little bit because you might be saying, hey, you haven't defined probability distribution. And we're going to, the, these definitions kind of hook together. So in order to talk about random variables, you need to have distributions. And in order to talk about distributions, you need to have random variables. Um, let me actually just say a moment um, about, let me say a little bit, this is for clarification, because we're now listing another type of distribution. So far, we've been introduced to frequency distribution, right? So we've been introduced to frequency distributions. And remember, what was a frequency distribution? Well, for a frequency distribution, we had some data, like maybe you had 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 1, 3, 7, 2, 0, 6, right? You just had some data that you had accumulated, and you could split it up into classes. So you might have, so you have over here your classes, and then you have your frequency, right? So for instance, maybe our class is actually just one, so we could have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Right? And now we say, well, now how many zeros do we have? So 1, 2. Okay, so our frequency of zeros is 2. How many 1s do we have? 1, 2. We have two 1s. How many 2s do we have? 1, 2. Two twos. Okay. How many threes do we have? One, two. Two threes. How many fours? Zero. How many fives? Zero. How many sixes? One. How many sevens? One. Eight, zero, zero, zero. And zero. And now we could draw the graph, right, of this frequency distribution. So that's one thing we could do. Then we have frequency distributions where our class is actually has a class width. So we could have from 0 to 2, from 3 to 5, 6 to 9, no, 8, 9 to 11, right? And now we would count, we would see how many. How many data points are in the class 0 to 2? Well, 6. How do I know this? Because over here on the left, I know I have two zeros, two ones, and two twos. So my frequency for this class is going to be 6. And now what about 3 to 5? Let's see here. It's just going to be 2 because if I add that up, 2 plus 0 plus 0. So they're going to be 2 from 3 to 5. What about 6 to 8? 2 and then 9 to 11, 0. So we have each of these is an example of a frequency distribution, right? And it's actually kind of misleading to call this a class because usually a class has a class width. Quick question. For this frequency distribution on the right, what is the class width? Do you remember how to find the class width? You look at your two lower limits. So 3 minus 0. So 3 is our class width. Class width. 3 minus 0. 3. Right, we could find our midpoints. And to find our midpoints, you add. Right, so you say 0 plus 2 divided by 2, 3 plus 5 divided by 2, 6 plus 8 divided by 2, 9 plus 11 divided by 2. So we can find our midpoints, we have our lower limits, our upper limits, our lower, lower boundaries, our upper boundaries, and all of that. Now this is another type of way, this on the left is another type of way of organizing, and it's also a frequency distribution because it tells you the frequency of each of the numbers, right? We are now going to introduce to this bucket a third type of distribution. 
And our third type of distribution is going to be called a probability distribution. And here's what a probability distribution has. A probability distribution is going to be a chart, and we're going to have our left and our right, okay? So on the left, we'll have x, and on the right, we'll have p of x. p of x is going to be the probability of getting this value of x. So p of x is the probability of x occurring. Okay? So, um, right now, definitely, if you are a little, and we actually will, I'll put up a video kind of as a refresher video. So, for your probability facts, for instance, all probabilities have to add up to one, right? So, you say, what's the probability? Um, we could quickly do a probability distribution for flipping a coin, right? So, if you flip a coin, what are the possible outcomes? The possible outcomes are head and tail. Now, what's the probability that you'll get a head? 50%, right? 50%. And then what's the probability that you'll get a tail? 50%. So, notice that 50% is the same as 0 0.5. And whenever you add up your probabilities, they always add up to 1. Okay, so that's kind of the idea of what we're doing here. So a random variable, which is going to be denoted by x, right, is the representation of all of the possible, all of the possible outcomes. So anything that's in this column here, right, in this case of flipping a coin, what are the outcomes? You could get a head or you could get a tail. So those are the two possible outcomes. Now let's look at these examples here. The first one here is number of sales calls a person makes in one day. Right, so the number of calls that a salesperson makes in one day. You don't know how many calls the person is going to make. You just have to wait and see and then count it up at the end. But X could be zero. Maybe the salesperson makes no calls. Could be one, could be two, could be three. Who knows, maybe the person could make a million calls in the day, right? Maybe they're making the phone calls with the robot. Maybe they're just calling, saying hi, bye, and hanging up. And who knows how many they can make, right? Now, what about this? X equals the hours spent on sales calls in one day. Again, could be zero, because you could spend no hours on a sale call. You could spend half an hour, right? Couldn't you spend 30 minutes? You could spend two minutes. You could spend a minute and 45 seconds. You could spend... Right, so for here, for this, for this uh, random variable, the possibilities are anything from 0 to 24. And I'm using interval notation here because you could spend 24 hours. So say you're on a phone call just continuously, you never get off the phone, you're on that phone 24 hours a day. Okay? and any number in between. So you could be on the phone for 2.367, 2 2.367, 8925, blah, 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 hours, right? So you, how many hours can you spend on sales calls in one day? Any number in between 0 and 24. Now this distinction, actually these two examples, tell us are perfect examples of the difference in random variables. So for random variables, they can either be discrete or continuous. And the main way to tell the difference between discrete and continuous is to think about how you would plot the possible outcomes. So if, when you plot the possible outcomes, they're separated dots, that's a discrete random variable. So for for example, here, x is equal to the number of sales calls a salesperson makes in a day. You can't make 1.5 sales calls, right? You either make 0, 1, 2, right? Distinct uh, dots that are, you know, totally separated from each other. On the other hand, for sales calls, hours that you spend on the phone, it could be any number in between 0 and 24, right? So 
if you have an uncountable number of possible outcomes and it's represented, this is the key, represented by an interval on the number line, okay, so if it's represented by an interval on the number line, then we're talking about a continuous random variable, okay? All right, so we've got our two different types of random variables. So in general, we've got our random variable, right? So we're talking about a random variable. And we can classify random variables as either discrete or continuous. Let's practice for this first one here. So take a moment, read it. The answer is going to be discrete. Why? Because x is either going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, any number in between 0 and 500. So if we were to draw on a number line, right, so here's 0, here's 500, like here's 250, we would just have a bunch of little dots. Dot, 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 right? So it will be a discrete random variable. Let's look at the second example. So pause, read it. The answer is Continuous. Continuous because it can be any amount of gas, any amount in between zero and 21 gallons. Right? And in fact, lots of cars have uh, the way they measure. It's 45. Thank you. The way they measure is you know, um, the gas tank, it'll be like E to F, and then there's a dial. And that dial can be anywhere in between F and E. And if your car is like mine, and if you're like me, then you know how far below E <laughs> you could go. So sometimes I'm driving, it's horrible, but sometimes my dial is below E. So, but I know it can't get like down to here, right? So there's a range. There's always a range, and it can be any value in between, right? So that's the point, is that it's continuous. So if you were to put this on a number line, the volume of the gas is going to be anywhere in between 0 and 21 gallons. So we wouldn't put dots. We would put, we would have to highlight the entire interval. Okay. Now let's look at probability distributions. Okay, so we talked about this a little bit before. Basically for probability distribution, in the left hand column, you're going to, for probability distribution in the left hand column, you're gonna put all of the possible outcomes. Okay, so you're gonna list all of the possible outcomes of your random variable, all possible outcomes of your random variable. But let me actually explain that a little bit better because look up here. For this frequency distribution, I could have kept going and mentioned 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, right? I could have put negative numbers, negative one, negative two. I didn't, why? Because none of these values is a negative number, right? And actually, I could have stopped it's 7 because I don't have a number that's greater than 7 so I really don't need to include any number that's above 7 or below 0 in my frequency histogram and it's the same the same reasoning applies for probability distribution so even though you're putting all possible outcomes you usually don't include um, like you there's you know you stop at a certain point, right? Like for instance, I could put here for this one, which was um, 
what uh, the outcome for when you flip a coin. Are you going to get heads or tails? Right? I could put, oh, the coin is going to be on its side. But that has a 0%. Because if you flip a coin, what's the likelihood that it's going to be on its side? Zero. I could say, oh, another possible outcome is that the coin is going to stay and stuck in the air. Stuck. Stay stuck in air. That is a possible outcome. Is it not? Well, you know, no, it's not a possible outcome, really, because the probability of it staying stuck in the air is 0%. Right? So you only list, right? you don't list every possible outcome that you can imagine. You list the outcomes that are reasonable. Okay? So there's, you know, there's a little finesse to this. It's, um, that's why we can't have computers doing everything, because you've got to tell the computer what's reasonable and what's not. All right, so let's go to our discrete probability distributions. Here's the deal with discrete probability distributions. The sum of your probabilities, the sum of the probabilities, always has to be equal to 1. That's going to ensure that you've taken into account every likely outcome. Okay. Another thing is that each probability has to be between 0 and 1. So you can't have a probability that's a negative number. You can't have a probability that's 2.5, right? Every probability has to be in between 0 and 1 because probabilities have to be in between 0 and 100%. Okay. So let's talk about how to construct a discrete probability distribution. So the first thing is you have to figure out what are, your, what are the outcomes that you're going to keep track of. Right? So these are going to be the numbers that go down your left-hand column. Okay. Next, you make a frequency distribution for the possible outcomes. How frequently does each outcome occur? Then you find the sum of all the frequencies, and from there you're able to find the probability of each outcome. So I would say the next one is find the probability of each possible outcome. So these are the big steps, right? So you write down your... So here you're writing down, this is going to be your left column. And the probability, this is going to be your right column. And lastly, you can check that each probability is between 0 and 1 and that the sum of the probabilities is 1. Because again, in order to be a probability distribution, you, you must satisfy these two conditions, right? Each probability has to be in between 0 and 1, and when you add up all your probabilities, it has to be equal to 1. Okay, so let's do some practice here. So this is an example. We're going to construct a discrete probability distribution. So go ahead and read this example. Okay, so here's what here's how we're going to go ahead and do this. So I want to have my x, and then I want to have my probability of x occurring. This is my goal. Okay, so what are all the possible outcomes? So the scores that you can get on the test are 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. So I'm going to, so remember before we had x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5. Well, my x1 is going to be 1. x2 is going to be 2, 3, 4, and 5. The xn that I'm talking about are these xn right here. These xn right here. Right? So there are five possible outcomes. Right? So I'm going to put those 1, 
two, three, four, five. Now I need to figure out what's the probability of getting a one on this score. Sorry, what's the probability of getting a score of one on this test? Well, I'm going to tell that based on the fact that 24, 24 people got a 1. So the probability of getting a 1 is going to be 24 out of 150. Why? Because there are 150 total employees. So the probability of getting a 1 must be 24 out of 150. And that is the same as 0 0.16. Okay, so here I'll put 24 out of 150, which is 0 0.16. So what we're saying is that 16% of the people got a score of 1. Now, what percentage of the people got a score of 2? Well, that's going to be um, fairly similar. I just need to take this. So I've got 33. 33% of the workers, 33, 33 employees got a score of 2. So the probability that you get a 2 is going to be 33 out of 150. Okay? So let's see here. So this is going to be 33. Let me make this larger. 33 out of 150. Okay, and now that is equal to 0 0.22. Now what about for 3? So 42, 30, 21, I can go ahead and just copy these. 42, 30, 21. 42, 30, 21. So this will be 42 out of 150. 30 out of 150. And then 21 out of 150. Okay. Let me make my little lines here. And let's see here. So 42 out of 150, that is equal to, using my calculator, 0 0.28. Now, what about 30 out of 150? That is equal to 20%, 0 0.20. And 21 out of 150 is equal to 0 0.14. Okay, so let's see here. So this is my probability distribution. Okay, so we could rewrite it horizontally. So we could have x and p of x. One, two, three, four, five. And for one, we'll have 0 0.16. For 2, we'll have 0 0.22. For 3, we'll have 0 0.28. For 4, we'll have 0 0.20. And for 5, we'll have 0 0.14. And now I can verify. I need to double check that each probability is between 0 and 1. Okay, and that's true. 16, right? This is in between 0 and 1, in between 0 and 1, in between 0 and 1, in between 0 and 1 in between 0 and 1. Got it? And now I need to verify that the sum of my probabilities is it equal to 1. That's what I need to check. So I need to add this up. So 0 0.16, 0 0.22, plus 0 0.28, plus 0 0.20, plus 0 0.14 should be equal to, let's see here, what do we get? So it'll be 30, 38, plus 28, plus 34, so that's 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, yep, 1.00. All right, so this is indeed a probability distribution. Okay, so let's go to our next example, which, oh, sorry, I guess I was supposed to use up more space than I did. Um, here's what we want to do. I'm, let's see here. My instructions were to construct a probability distribution for the random variable x, did that, then graph the distribution using a histogram. I forgot that I was supposed to do that. 
but lucky for me, it is included in our slides. Okay, so this is the graph of our probability distribution. So this is a graph of our distribution. Notice that our distribution is it's pretty symmetric. Do you see how it's pretty symmetric? So I'll say it's symmetric. Um, the mode is three, right? Because that's got the highest, that's got the biggest probability. And because each, so the width of each bar is one, right? What's the area of this rectangle? It would be one times, how high is that? That is 0 0.14. So the area is 0 0.14 of this rectangle. The area of this rectangle is going to be 0 0.2. Why? Because the height is 0 0.2, right? That's how we decided how tall to draw it, how high to draw the bar, right? So 4 has is going to have a height of 0 0.2. What you're doing over here is essentially you're creating a relative, you, you're doing um, relative frequency distribution, right? And um, so the height is going to be 0 0.2. The width is 1. So this area is 0 0.2. This area, the area of this bar right here, is going to be 0 0.28. And the area of each bar is the same as the probability of that outcome occurring. So this area is equal to 0 0.22 and the area of this first rectangular bar is equal to 0 0.16. So notice that if we add it's up nine hours. thank you. If we add up all of the areas so the sum of all of the areas is going to be equal to what? 1. And that's going to be really important for us to because uh that's going to be really important for us in the future because we're going to use that to our advantage. If we know the area under the curve, the area under this curve right here, right here's our curve, area under the curve is always equal to 1. That tells us certain properties about, about our graph. Okay, now let's move on to our third objective, which is to compute the mean of a probability distribution. Now, mean of a probability probability distribution. We want to do the mean. We're also going to do the variance and the standard deviation. So I want to point out that we have these formulas so the formulas I'm going to highlight for us. So here's our first formula. This is a formula for the mean. Our second formula, the formula for the variance. And then the third one is the formula for the standard deviation. Now, each of these formulas is very similar to the formula for the group the mean, variance, and standard deviation of grouped data, okay? We are going to use technology. So when we're doing these, we're going to use technology. And essentially what we're going to do is we're going to use the lists on our calculators to, to allow us to compute these things without making charts and tables, okay? So this is a formula. Basically, you add up the outcome times the probability that the outcome occurs. And that is the mean. Okay, let's do this example here for finding the mean. Oh, pretend like you don't see this. I should have blocked this out. It's not dark enough. Okay, so pretend you don't see this. Okay. 
here we go. Now we're getting dark. Because the reason why we want to pretend we don't see it is because we want to be able to make sure that we're doing this correctly. And we're not going to use, we're not going to use the charts and tables. We're going to be using technology. So we want to find the probability, we want to find the mean of the data for the, um, for taking that inventory, right, the personality inventory test for passive aggressive traits. This was our distribution. So I can copy this. Copy because I'm going to need it. Here we go. Paste. I'm going to paste it here. Um, and let me resize it so it's smaller. Okay. So now here's how to do it in your, or there, like I said, there are instructions on, um, on Canvas, right? So under our TI-84 resources module, check there. There are already instructions. But your L1 should be, in your calculator, your L1 and your L2. So L1 should be, you should put in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then for L2, you should put in 0 0.16, 0 0.22, 0 0.28, 0 0.20, 0 0.14. Okay. And then for your L3, you should get 0 0.16, 0 0.44, 0 0.84, 0 0.80, 0 0.70. And then your final answer should be 2.94. Okay. And so if you are following along and doing it with your TI-84, then you'll know what this means. And if you're not using your TI-84, run, go get your calculator, and come back because you want to make sure that you can do this stuff using a TI-84 because that's what you're going to be allowed to use on the exam. Okay, so practice how you want to perform. All right. Um, we can do a similar example. We'll do a similar example of finding the variance and standard deviation. But before we do that, let's kind of talk about what this means, right? What does it, what is the meaning of a 2.94 as the mean, right? Finding the mean. Now, this is for that personality inventory test. And to say that there's a 2.94, how do we interpret that? Well, here's a way to interpret it. On average, the people, the employees in that company would get a score of 3. Our mean was 2.94, right? So our mean was 2.94. Let me write that down. which is slightly less than three. And now score of three indicated neither trait, neither passive nor aggressive, right? So one is extremely passive, right? So this is extremely passive. And the five is extremely aggressive. And three is neither. So it's like neutral. So if there was a mean, the mean was 2.94, that means that on average the people, the employees are, they tend to be slightly more passive than aggressive, right? So they're slightly, just slightly to the left of being neutral. Okay? Does that mean that everybody is passive? No. There are some people that are extremely aggressive, right? But overall, on average, slightly passive. Okay. Now let's look at let's calculate the variance in the standard deviation. Again, with the variance in the standard deviation, you're going to want to use technology. You already have your um essentially essentially the 
probability distribution is what you're going to put in to your calculator. So this is going to be L1. And your second column is going to be your L2. Okay. Now, let's tell the third column. So the third column should be um, well, let's see here. So I, I'm not going to write down all of the different columns that you should get. I'll just tell you that for your variance, now remember you calculate your variance first, which is your sigma squared. You should get 1.616. Okay. And then once you calculate your variance to get your standard deviation, that's just sigma. So you're going to take the square root of 1.616. Okay. And then that's going to be about 1.3. Okay. Now the last concept is, um, this is one that I said is really, really useful. And I always make sure that I put a, um, an expected value question on exams because it's um, very practical. Um, so what is the expected value? It's essentially the same, it is essentially another way of saying the mean. So it's the mean of a random variable the mean of a probability distribution of a random variable. Okay, so the formula is exactly the same as the formula for the mean of a probability distribution. So this is bugging me. So let's put this equal to the mean of the probability distribution of the random variable. Okay? So that's more precise. It is the, the expected value is the mean of the probability distribution of that random variable. Right? So if you say, what is the expected value of the random variable? Well, it is the mean of the probability distribution of the random variable. So going back to our beginning examples, right, so we had some of some random variables. The number of Fortune 500 companies that lost money in the previous year, if you were to look at the expectation, right, expectation of X, what does that tell you? That tells you how many companies, Fortune 500 companies, do you expect to lose money this year? So it's like you're making a prediction based off of what's happened in the past. Same thing here. Well, the volume of gas in a 21-gallon tank, imagine if you were to take, um, you know, go into all the cars in the parking lot and check to see how much gas is in each gas tank that can hold up to 21 gallons. And you say, well, how much gas do you expect a person in this parking lot to have in their gas tank? That would be the expectation of the random variable. So let's do this last example, and that will, that will finish us out here. This is an example of finding an expected value. Okay. So at a raffle, 1,500 tickets are sold. Tickets cost $2 each. There are four prizes you can win. $500, $250, $150, and $75. You buy one ticket. What is the expected value of your gain? Okay. So, we need to set up a random variable. They already tell us what the random variable should be in the way that the question is phrased. What is the expected value of your gain? That means my random variable x should be the gain. All right, so let's go ahead and write this out here. So x is my random variable, and it is equal, it's going to be equal to the gain the gain from buying 
purchasing one ticket. One ticket. Now, what are all of the possible outcomes? If I purchase one ticket, what are all of the possible outcomes? Because that's what's going to go in my left-hand corner here. What are the possible outcomes? I could gain. So I could, I could lose. I could win $75, I could win $150, I could win $250, and I could win the big prize, $500. That's what can happen. If I buy a ticket, one of these five things will happen. Either I'll lose or I'll win a cash prize. Now, how does that translate to my gain. If I lose, what is my gain? Negative two dollars. What do you mean negative two dollars? If I don't win anything, I paid two dollars, what is my gain? Negative two. Because I paid two dollars, so I'm out two dollars. If I win the seventy-five dollar prize, what's my gain? Seventy-three dollars. If I win $150, my gain is going to be $148. If I win $250, my gain is going to be $248. And if I win $500, my gain is going to be $498. So I've got my outcomes. It's 9.15. Thank you. So I've got all my possible outcomes as my random variables. Okay? And you can tell that the top value is what happens if I lose. I do not win. And on, you can, you know, on down the line, you can see my gain based on which prize. Now, the second column needs to be the probability of X. Right. So what's the probability of having an outcome of negative two? What's the probability of losing, essentially? Well, if 1,500 tickets are sold, right, so 1,500 tickets are sold, and only one, two, three, four tickets are winning tickets. That means four tickets are winning tickets. So 19, sorry, 1496, 1496 tickets are losing tickets. Are losers. So the probability that I'm gonna lose is 1496 over 1500. You see that? And the probability that I'm going to win $73, or the probability that my gain is going to be 73, 1 out of 1,500. 1 out of 1,500. 1 out of 1,500 for each of these. Because there's only one ticket, one winning ticket, right? So, in your calculator, I believe you don't even have to uh, convert your fraction to decimals. You can just put, this is going to be your L1, your L2. For L2, you can just put in there 1496 divided by 1500, and it'll automatically compute that for you, right? So your answer should be, let's see here, so your L3 should be oh I haven't figured out the L3s let me just say here that your so you'll you'll get your L3s and then you'll add them up 
And your answer is going to be mu is equal to e of x, which is equal to negative 1.35. Now, what does that mean? That means you can expect to lose $1.35 for every $2 ticket that you buy.